Hello, everybody. My name is Carol Siufi. I'm the market research analyst at Branch Food, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all today. By way of introduction, Branch Food is a Boston based innovation hub that connects innovators across the food value chain. Startup founders and small business owners, corporate leaders, and industry experts come to Branch Food for innovation support, curated networking, and strategic advice. What differentiates us is our specialized focus within the food industry, upstream and downstream, cross-sector and cross-borders. We are connected with over 15,000 stakeholders across the value chain and are a nexus where founders from around the globe collaborate with leaders and experts for the betterment of our food system. If you're a founder looking for personalized support and strategic advice, please reach out. We would love to help. And if you're currently fundraising, take a look at our sister company, Branch Venture Group, a network of angel investors that support early stage food ventures and that was the second most active food investment group in the US in 2021. Visit our website at branchfood.com to learn about our upcoming educational seminars that we co-host with industry experts. If you missed any previous session of the Retail Success uh, Series or any other educational seminar, you can watch them all on our YouTube channel. Um, check out our monthly community tables to expand your network and crowdsource insights from the greater community. And be sure to uh, save the date for our Food Edge Summit, which is taking place on May 3rd, 4th, and 5th, and where you can acquire targeted insights about the future of food and forge connections with innovators across the value chain, virtually and in person in Boston. And don't forget to sign up for our monthly newsletter to stay updated on the latest food innovation, news events, and business support resources. Today, we're thrilled to, to dive deep into the world of functional beverages revealing strategies that you can implement to succeed in retail and ensure continued growth. Special thanks to Tina Adolfsson, the VP of Marketing at Trax Retail, who is the mastermind behind this retail success series. And thank you to the entire Trax Retail and specifically the dynamic merchandising team for their support with this webinar and the series of webinars. Dynamic merchandising brings retail execution, merchandising and data to leading and growth brands in brick and mortar retail. Part of Trax Retail, a global company pioneering computer vision in retail, the retail platform allows customers to understand what is happening on shelf in every store all the time so they can focus on what they do best, delighting shoppers. A couple of notes before we begin, the session is recorded and will be shared with you all. The discussion will last 45 minutes and the last 15 minutes will be dedicated to Q&A from the audience. You can submit your questions throughout the session via the Q&A function down below on your screen. With that, I'd like to officially welcome our very own Laura Navda, founder of Branch Food and co-founder of Branch Venture Group, who will be moderating the discussion with Alana Andrews, founder and CEO at The Sway Corporation, Stephen Ellsworth, founder and CEO at Poppy, and Ben Witte, founder and CEO at Recess. Lauren, over to you. Thank you very much, Carol. And I just wanted to echo Carol's sentiments that it's a pleasure to be continuing our partnership with Dynamic Merchandising, a Trax retail company, um, to continue our retail success series. This is our last session, but hopefully we'll, we will be back with more um, uh, one day in the future. And I'd also like to thank our panelists today for joining us uh, to share more about their success in retail and how they've grown their functional beverage brands across the categories that they're selling in. Um, I'd like to start by asking each of our panelists to introduce themselves themselves and share a bit more about their origin story, uh, where their companies are at today, and would love to know really how you came to the name of your products because you each have such interesting product names. So maybe Alana, we can start with you and feel free to jump in. Yes, of course. Again, thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm delighted to be speaking to you all today. My name is Lana Andrews. I'm the CEO and founder of the Sway Corporation, otherwise known as Sway. And the creation of Sway really came out of a personal need. When I was eight years old, I was diagnosed as pre-diabetic. And I'm sure you can imagine, no child is truly trained how to handle such daunting news. Um, and that moment, I did decide that I needed to become, that, that I needed to not, not to become its next victim. I had to work out all the time, really make the steps towards building a healthier lifestyle. And after putting so much effort on the court, as I'm sure you know, I would go to stores and you would see you'd see plenty of shelves with bright colored drinks and really creative labels, but they were covering the loads of sugar and artificial ingredients in these sports drinks specifically. And then I realized two gaps in the market. One, there weren't healthy sports drinks, but two, there are no sports drinks for Gen Z athletes in particular. Fast forward about 10 years later, I'm, I'm now 18 and Sway launched last year in the spring of 2021. And we have now become the modern sports drink specifically designed for the Gen Z athletes. 
athlete. And the name is actually an acronym for our target market. It stands for Strong Wise Energetic Youth. Wonderful. Thank you, Alana. And very exciting to see your launch in progress um, continue. Uh, ben, would you like to go next? Sure. Um, great to be here. Thanks for uh, having me. Um, so I'm Ben. I'm the founder and CEO of Recess. Kind of the inspiration for Recess uh, came in about 2016, 17, where I was kind of exploring different uh, consumer brand uh, ideas to start. Uh, and my observation about the world is it felt like we were entering uh, a transformational period in history driven by technology. And that was leaving us all increasingly kind of stressed out and anxious. And my hypothesis was that people would be increasingly kind of prioritizing their kind of men mental health and mental well being. Um, and I saw an opportunity to create uh, basically a new category uh, of beverages that help consumers relax. Um, and so you'd seen obviously a big category of beverages focused on energy and stimulation driven by Red Bull and Monster Energy and the like. You obviously you have alcohol, which uh, drives intoxication. And I saw this kind of new opportunity for a new occasion uh, focused on, again, helping consumers feel calm and relaxed. Um, and our first uh, and core product line uh, is a sparkling water infused with CBD uh, and adaptogenic herbs. Uh, which we launched in kind of fall 2018. And since then we became kind of a, a relaxation platform. And I'd really say kind of validated uh, this new kind of proposition for consumers and have driven the development uh, of this new category, which is now uh, I'd say starting to, you know, really grow into its own um, and kind of beginning to develop uh, at retail. So uh, a lot more I can dive into, but that's a bit of how we think about recess. Great, thank you, Ben. Steven. <laughs> yeah, so thanks for having me here, uh, Ben, Alana. It's a pleasure to be on this panel with you guys, and and uh, congrats on, on all of the success thus far. So um, Poppy is a prebiotic soda that, that focuses really on flavor and functionality, particularly gut health. And so um, Poppy was created just like Alana out of a solution to a problem that my wife had. So we were living on the road working oil and gas projects, which is completely different than CPG, food and bev. And she had a bunch of different health issues. She had, um, she was bloated all the time. She had skin issues. She just didn't feel right. And she didn't really know what was going on. So like a lot of people, she went to the doctor to, you know, figure out what was going on. And probably about 12 months in, she was really left with no solution. And so, she went to the internet and she read that drinking apple cider vinegar, which is the, the core functionality of our product, could really help to reset and detox your body. And so we sort of put her on this journey of health and wellness. She discovered how important gut health was, right? And basically she loved the benefits and the functionality of apple cider vinegar, but she hated the taste. I'm sure a lot of you guys have tried ACV, maybe a shot, maybe in a smoothie or something like that. It's terrible. So that's why Poppy focuses on flavor first and then functionality, because at the end of the day, product has to taste amazing. So as we start to look at the name Poppy, we wanted to, and really where we saw the white space was a modern soda for the next generation, right? And we truly believe that's what Poppy is. Gen Z, millennials, they don't want just great flavor. They also want functionality. They also want clean ingredients. And so that's where Poppy is were a soda pop for the next generation. And as we start to look at one of the, the main pillars of Poppy, we think about Poppy as fashion, right? And we think about Poppy as moving culture. And so that's why it's Poppy, it's, it's pop cultured. Awesome. Well, thank you all uh, for sharing a little bit more about where your brand started and what really inspired um, you to launch these products. I think as we talk to entrepreneurs across the food ecosystem, so many of them have similar stories of, you know, per personal health experiences that have really inspired them to launch products. And, um, and so, you know, I think that's an interesting foray to think first um, uh, about, you know, really the retail category that you decided to launch in with this type of product that you're bringing to market. Um, identifying white space and really the differentiator that appeals to customers can be difficult in crowded categories, but as we know, that's also where the greatest opportunity lies. So can we talk a little bit about, you know, how you zeroed in on your key product differentiator um, and identified, you know, what that white space really was 
uh, for your product. Whoever would like to go first, feel free to jump in. I'm happy to go. Um, so just kind of uh, double clicking a little bit on the origin of recess. So I had this thesis, you know, that the world was going crazy and we would all be stressed out and would prioritize our, our mental health and wellness. And then I started to see kind of the rise of kind of CBD oil and like adaptogenic herbs in the supplement aisle, basically. And I looked at that as like, what do these represent? And they really represented consumers' desire to feel calm, right? And I looked at calm as like this new feeling that essentially people would seek out. But, you know, I looked up like the, basically the use case of putting like CBD oil, CBD oil under your tongue that tastes like grass was not a great one. But I looked at it as like the equivalent of like caffeine, right? Just like a commoditized functional ingredient that enables a feeling. And I saw the opportunity to really build a brand and a functional beverage, you know, around that uh, feeling, so to speak, just like Red Bull did. And so I kind of modeled recess off of Red Bull in the early days in the sense of Red Bull was not marketing caffeine, it was marketing Red Bull gives you wings, right? And so mm -hmm. I didn't really touch on that in the intro, but the name recess was really inspired by school recess, which was that moment throughout your day to, to, to reset, to rebalance so you could come out the other side as, you know, your, your, best, your best self, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, we kind of architected this brand and this idea of, uh, you know, take a recess so you can feel calm, cool, collected, you know, an antidote to modern times and really, uh, I'd say, develop like a unique kind of lifestyle brand and brand world around the drink uh, that I can talk more about. Uh, but I think that's how we kind of, uh, those are the dots I connected to, to land at the original idea. Yeah, I can, I can piggyback on that. I think that I'm probably the opposite of, of Ben initially, um, you know, which is, uh, which is which has been a, a fun, really uh, crazy evolution, right? I think you know for us it was really sort of that si solution, right? And I think that the timing was really good. This is when kombucha was really having a moment. You know, gut health was there, and so there was always sort of that um, like base understanding of how important gut health was, right? And I think it was sort of over time and just giving the product to consumers that really what was you know, no surprise, what was really resonating with the individuals was how amazing the product tasted, right? And so that's really sort, sort of where we discovered the true unlock for, for the white space, right? This modern soda for the next generation is, is really um, creating a beverage that um, tastes amazing, but also happens to be healthy for you. Whereas kombucha was really focused on this stuff is really healthy, like try and stomach it, um, and you know, you can experience these health benefits for us. It was like, we want functionality to be super important, but to be secondary in the messaging. We want you to have ultimate refreshment and enjoyment when you enjoy poppy. And so for us, it was really sort of that evolution. And it was really sort of that identification and that, that positioning that really was the, the key unlock in, in white space, so to speak. Yeah, I can definitely add on, on to that. So for, for Sway, our main target market is the Gen Z athlete. When I had that problem in the grocery store, I couldn't find any options. It was mainly because a lot of these normal sports drinks that are saturating the market, if you look into their company plans, they're actually made for athletes who are 25 years old and up. They're not made for younger athletes. So it's, it's essentially giving Gen Z athletes and, and the youth no choice. It's giving them no option but to have drinks saturated with sugar and ingredients that aren't truly going to benefit them. And and so when we, when we were truly making Sway, we wanted to, to touch on three main points. One was the sugar aspect. Two was also making a product that had ingredients essentially made for them. And also it was the marketing, it was the marketing and branding aspect. So for Sway, we worked with pediatricians and people to really identify what Gen Z athletes truly need. For branding, Gen Zers in particular, they want to buy from products and brands that recognize them as people and they wanna be able to connect with the people behind the company. So having it made by Gen Z for Gen Z was really important to implement was really important to also add on. And then also the sugar aspect. A lot, a lot of times with research right now, it's showing that Gen Zers are buying less and less soda because of the high amounts of sugar content. So so it's why we really wanna decrease that, which is kind of targeting towards this new group of consumers. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. And and I, it sounds like all of you, you know, really taking a very consumer and customer centric approach to um, the product, the brand, but also the timing of your launch, which is, um, uh, you know, 
all of these products I would consider very timely in terms of the functionality that they can deliver and that really aligning well with what we're seeing consumers most interested in today as they think about um, the greater experience of the beverage that they're in consuming. Um, I want to talk a little bit too about initial retail traction. Um, we know it's critical for a successful launch and you know despite the fact that we all you know maybe fall into this idea of well, everybody eats, everybody drinks. This would be great for every, everybody has to have better gut health. Everybody wants to relax. Um, really, that's not good enough. And we've really got to zero in on, you know, who that core customer is and, and what that kind of, uh, where you're going to get that initial traction at, at launch. So can you talk a little bit about, you know, your initial retail strategy and how you thought about, you know, scaling to other types of retail over time? So in identification of that, you know, where you think you're going to get that retail traction, um, how did that inform, inform strategy at the onset? And then um, as you continue to build the companies? Yeah, I can, I can start out with that. I think, um, you know, it, it really just depends on one, your product, sort of your functionality and how mainstream uh, that that functional ingredient is, right? Uh, is, it, is it probiotics? Is it prebiotics? How, what's the awareness around sort of that, that functionality? Um, you know, I think it's really important in, in sort of your retail strategy. For us, it was apple cider vinegar, which is, the, you know, the core functionality of Poppy. As you think about apple cider vinegar, ACV, just for, for ease of conversation here, uh, it's mainly found in the natural channel, right? Uh, but as we sort of look at modern soda for the next generation, soda is very much conventional. But because of the, functional, of the functional ingredient, really where people were aware of it, we went the, the typical sort of natural independent grocers, um, initially just because that's where we saw the, the early adopters would live. Uh, we had significant support from, from Whole Foods and Sprouts and things like that. So that's where we started. And so it was really national natural, focused by tier one conventional in key geographies where we had the right route to market and where we had feet in the streets, right? And so we sort of liken our zealous sales force to, to, to athletes and we sort of, you know, have that, that internal um, competition, but but really that that's been our strategy. And as brand awareness grows, as awareness grows around the functional ingredient and just around the category in general, then we really start to go in towards the center of the country, uh, tier two grocery. And and for us, um, you know, C store really kind of comes on at the sort of next year for us, so year three of our evolution. Yeah, I can go next. Um... So, I mean, we launched direct to consumer. I had like two big theses going back to 2017 or 2018 when we launched. One was you know, the opportunity for this new category and new functional proposition. And then the second was no one was talking about digital back then, which was like shocking to me, both from a distribution standpoint as well as a brand building standpoint. Um, and so, you know, our plan was to launch direct to consumer to build the buzz uh, in the buzz online in order to go offline. Um, and uh, I was based in New York. We launched out of New York and uh, New York City kind of made sense as our first kind of target market for a number of reasons. And the first of which is that because we use CBD, we couldn't sell that line into uh, national re retailers because of the kind of regulatory dynamics. Um, and New York is the, uh, is, has basically because of the density and the prominence of bodegas and corner stores, you know, within basically three months, we got into like a thousand retailers in New York. Um, and it just felt like recess was all around you. Uh, and our core kind of initial target consumer was kind of the young professional millennial uh, that was in New York, stressed out, looking for an alternative to alcohol after, you know, a night of work and, and things like that. Um, and we've since um, had to take kind of this uh, kind of broad regional DSD approach where we've entered, you know, uh, a number of markets uh, focusing on kind of independent and regional accounts, uh, unlike uh, Stephen at Poppy, who's had who's been able to kind of enter national retailers right away because the unique aspects of our category, we had to kind of take a different approach. Um, and we've since launched a line called Recess Mood, which leverages magnesium, and we'll be entering kind of some national retailers with that this year. So it's been a a very unique uh, situation for Recess because of the CBD dynamics. Um, which has forced us to kind of focus on kind of independent and regional accounts to go build the brand and the category before entering national retailers. Yeah, with Sway, it's really a combination of both, I would say. So we launched 
um, via e-commerce, and then now we're taking it offline this year. So this year we'll be focusing in our key three um, geographical cities, which are Philly, the DC area, and then also Chicago. And we're kind of doing something different with, with retail, really going directly to our consumers, students and Gen Zers in particular. So in addition to going to these independent stores and, and these big national chains, we'll also be going to schools as well and the HBCU level and the college level, K through 12, and also different independent gyms too, so that we can really hit the wellness category. Great, thank you all for sharing more about that. Um, I'm also curious, I'd like to talk a little bit and switch to how you approach marketing a functional beverage. Um, I'm seeing the question in the chat, which is related to the bioavailability of the product. So we will certainly get to that because I think that, that um, the food science aspect of this and the actual um, uh, kind of impact of the products that you're um, selling is a very interesting topic and, and we will get to that. Um, but I wanna talk a little bit about the uh, value proposition of the product and how that stands out on shelf. Um, if you can touch on that, that would be great. Yeah, I can, I can jump in here. Um, you know, I think, I think for, for us, um, you know, I think also, also for, for Ben here, just, I, I know Ben for a little bit, but, you know, uh, it, for us, it really started about packaging, right? Mm -hmm. I think you've got to develop a brand and a package. I mean, you've got a split second when somebody's looking at your product, whether or not they make the decision to reach out their hand and grab it. You know, so I think it's, it really starts with that packaging, having something that's gonna capture their attention in a split second so that they pick it up and they start to read it. You know, so for us, as you sort of look at our package, right? It, it sort, of, sort of illuminates the fact that we're, we're favoring flavor over functionality. Right, so you look at a can of poppy, the bright colors, it just, it, it looks delicious, right? And so I think that just having a package that people gravitate to um, is, is really been something for us that not only, it doesn't necessarily communicate functionality, but it communicates a premium product, right? And so as you sort of think about a premium product in this day and age, especially in food and bev, there's gonna be some sort of clean ingredients or sort of some sort of functionality. So for us, it was really that that packaging and driving those those brand aesthetics. Yeah, I mean, similar, I, I'd say, um, point of view in terms of if you look at our package um, was just, you know, by design to be very minimal uh, and kind of stand out from a lot of most packages on the shelf, which are, you know, very much kind of in your face, which um, I think aligns to what we're selling, which is this, you know, feeling of calm in our tagline is calm, cool, collected. Um, the packaging really frames the name recess, which kind of says it all, uh, so to speak. And I think it was, you know, uh, intriguing enough to like have you pick it up, you know, turn it around and read the story on the back. And so I do think the packaging is critical, uh, you know, similar to Stephen, I also believe in like the importance of building out, you know, driving culture, so to speak. I think the best beverages, if you look historically, they always uh, really successfully like marketed a feeling like we always said like our one of our core taglines was like we canned a feeling again calm cool collected um, and if you look at you know corona for example that entire brand was around sitting at the beach you know red bull was around stimulation so they kind of aligned to the action sports community coca-cola was about like happiness right um, and so i think we you know we've really successfully like, built this you know interesting brand world uh, around the beverage within instagram um, and have this kind of unique brand voice, uh, which we kind of describe as like a social commentary on the millennial Gen Z existence. And um, starting this year, we'll start to kind of expand on the kind of foundation you know, that we've built uh, pretty significantly. Um, and so, yeah, I think those are a couple, couple points. Yeah, our packaging really mimics our target market. Our three main points are being bold, innovative, and inclusive. So we have kind of actually right here, we have a we have a shrink sleeves kind of bold, it's modern, it's sleek. And so that's kind of where, that's kind of the direction of what Gen Z is really heading into. Also going back to the culture aspect, um, Gen Z is really into, to bring it up again, brand transparency. Who's behind the companies and the brands that they're buying from? Who is this person and why did they create it? And so we really want to emphasize on our social media channels, the whole pillar and the values and the core values of Sway. So we have different series called the Sway Zone where we interview nutritionists and different people really diving deep into our core values and teaching more people about not just providing a drink, but educating about why we've included ingredients in Sway to make it functional. 
I'd like to talk to you a little bit more about um, maybe expanding on the packaging piece, which is but you've all commented on how your specific product looks, but kind of curious about other ways that you stand out in store, whether it be through displays or, you know, are you looking at paying for end caps, um, extra locations, you know, such as near the registers or other, are you merchandised in other areas that have been, you know, particularly helpful in terms of driving product sales? Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, where you're, where you're located in store and where it's worked out best for you? Yeah, I can, I can, I can jump in. Um, you know, the, the, you know, for us, where do we want to be located in store? I think the question is easy. It's, it's everywhere. Uh, you know, since, since everywhere isn't an option, obviously we sort of prioritize uh, different, different placements for, for us, because we are a shelf stable product being off shelf, being cold, being by the register on an end cap, you know, that is really where we see the velocities, you know, as you're launching a brand, specifically a shelf stable brand, that's a premium price point and has functionality. Um, you really have to, to drive that awareness. Right. And so, um, and so it's, it's, it's all about, it's all about that execution, right? People, people don't know Poppy when it launched, people didn't know recess when it launched or sway when it launched, right. It's not on their shopping list. So if you think about, retail right it, or you or you think about online it's all about sort of creating omnipresence like those those billboards those brand moments you've got to do the same thing in store you've got to smack people in the face you've got to make them aware of your product and so for us as a shelf stable product it's about you know how many cases can we put on the floor because if you have the belief in your product that once people try it they'll come back and purchase it it's all about it's all about getting product in as many points of distribution around the store as you possibly can yeah reinforcing that uh, multiple touch points actually drive people to the point of purchase. Um, curious, uh, Ben, Alana, if that's uh, similar for you as well, or your, your approach. Yeah, no, definitely echo those sentiments. And then you know, I think being very thought, you know, with the messaging that we use on our point of sale and the displays that we use, trying to uh, succinctly articulate kind of the value proposition and uh, experiment with different messaging and see how kind of velocity changes and you know, we'll do, you know, different, there's a bunch of different use cases for recess. So for example, dry January is a massive month for us. Probably the primary use case for, for recess today is as an alternative to alcohol. And so we'll kind of update our messaging throughout the year uh, in, in store as well. We're also beginning to experiment with, you know, different placements in the store, including even in the alcohol aisle and that has kind of zero proof, uh, you know, beer and uh, cocktails and, and things like that become larger, how can we kind of experiment positioning uh, ourselves within those uh, you know, parts of the store? Um, but yeah, I think in the early days, you know, to, to Stephen's point, it's about, you know, every, you know, you want to be in as many placements uh, as possible, uh, while also, uh, I think, testing to see, you know, where it's going to perform the best. Yeah, we've been focusing in the refrigerator section, but also I think it's really important to note that for consumers, you want to make sure that your brand is consistent throughout each of your displays and wherever they see your product. So you have your social media accounts, but are they going to recognize that same brand in the store as well? So I think also having that throughout is really is really important to incorporate. But we're also thinking of expanding to other areas in the health aisles, but right now mainly in the refrigerator section. Mm, yeah. Well, and I think you're you're touching on something really important, Alana, which is you know that interplay between retail and what people are looking at when they're shopping in the store and then your social media and, and given the last two years there's been such an emphasis on direct consumer and e-commerce for emerging brands to raise awareness about their products in hopes that they can launch in retail you know once kind of um, the opportunity presents itself but how have you leveraged sort of online social um, to support in-store sales and have there been any you know, best practices, tips, tricks that have been helpful in driving um, purchase and retail uh, based on what you've been doing on social? Yeah, I, what I'd say is I think I always, I think earned media is like probably the most important thing um, uh, for consumer brands, whether that's creating content that people want to share or creating uh, a beverage in a package that mm -hmm. is very shareable. Um, you know, we get you know, dozens or, you know, a hundred or like, you know, hundreds of uh, people tagging, drinking recess and tagging it, you know, every day or every week. Um, and I think that's been a large part responsible for creating awareness, which drives kind of offline uh, retail sales velocities. 
when you bring on strategic kind of retailers, definitely promoting that uh, at retail. Uh, we're starting to work uh, test working with kind of uh, influencers in different regions that you know we're focused on to see you know how that can uh, kind of drive retail sales velocity. Mm -hmm. um, and I think having like a consistent kind of brand identity across with digital and kind of offline uh, marketing uh, activity uh, mm -hmm. is really important so that when you know consumers see you out in the world, they can just that triggers um, you know a certain uh, triggers your brand basically so which will drive kind of retail sales velocity. Great. Yeah, absolutely. I, uh, yeah, I, I, I echo that sentiment for sure. I think um, you know we at Poppy sort of this Gen Z millennial world, right? Um, it's all about convenience, right? So making sure that you're connecting with the customer at literally every touch point, whether that's, you know, all D2C online, whether that's sort of a hybrid where it's Instacart, you know, where they're pulling from the store, but it's showing up at your door, you know, whether that's retail. I think it's, um, we, we, we always look at this sort of this omni-channel 360 approach where digital is fueling uh, is fueling retail and retail is fueling um, is is fueling digital. So it's been it's been really fun. I think, you know, for us, one thing that we've had a ton of success with, you know, Ben uh, specifically EMV, same thing. It's like, you know, getting your product out there. If you've got a package, we 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 pride ourselves in having a super grammable package, right? So once again, going back to Poppy and fashion, it's like you look at our feed. People are just matching their Poppy with their outfits. They're tagging us. They're, you know, it's this, it's this whole lifestyle that we're talking about. And, you know, for us, we've really been huge on the influencer playbook, right? It's like, you know, we had a, a, a partnership, like a, a pretty big partnership with a huge celebrity. And it's, it was really funny to see, um, you know, how, how that sort of translated, what impacts that had, as opposed to sort of working with these curated influencers, these trusted voices right? Seeding them product, having them talk about products. So that's, that's been super, super impactful for us. And then Alana, you always talk about being transparent, being authentic. That's, that's super core to Poppy, right? And, and um, you know, we, we, we have this, this authentic founder story and Allison just got on TikTok and told her story, you know, in that one video that got over 32 million views, our TikTok hashtags got over 4, 4 billion page views. And it's like, it's just insane to see um, what being authentic and just having fun and telling your story and be producing relatable content does. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's uh, you know, I think it all, I think it all works in tandem, um, but, but definitely in this day and age, digital is just, it's just so important. Agree completely. Also, I think for us, it's been really vital to have events as well, um, kind of pushing our customers out into our location, physical location. So for example, we're, we're working with the gym and then we have taste tests with them. Um, where they're helping us formulating new flavors. So it's kind of just really involving them in the process as well. And then also, I think a slogan is a huge part of it too, making it more than a slogan, but also a movement and a community going back to culture. For us, it's way to play. And for us, sway means making your vision move. So we're really putting the question back into the hands of the consumer, how do you make your vision move? Gen Z, one of their pillars, again, is innovation, is entrepreneurship. They want to create their visions and their ideas now and turn it into reality. So really giving them kind of like the candle or the hand saying, okay, this is way it's going to help you make your vision move. Now, how are you going to do that for yourself? I think it's really forming a community and helping people go back to our physical locations too, to really um, continue with the whole message of it. Great. Thank you. Um, I want to switch gears and talk a little bit about data. So your products have been in market for a little while. Um, you're tracking their success. Uh, you're looking at, you know, your traction in specific markets. What information are you looking for? Um, what is worth buying? What isn't worth buying? Uh, what would you advise um, uh, entrepreneurs that are launching functional products to, to keep an eye on as they um, track their own success in sales and retail? 
I would have to say um, the SFA is a really great organization to join. It's called the Specialty Food Association. And so they have a lot of great data, um, also a network of other food and beverage entrepreneurs who you can connect with, kind of have a forum. And they host a variety of events throughout the year, including the Winter Fancy Food Show. Um, in addition, of course, survey.com and then also Food Bevy. They're both incredible resources where you again can connect with other food and beverage entrepreneurs, but also have loads of data um, at your fingertips too to learn about the emerging trends in the market. Yeah, I would, I would, I would echo that. Um, you know, it's, it's for, for us, data is king, right? Mm -hmm. It's, it's. Uh, I think as the as the brand continues to evolve, it's like you, you for us, we're, we're getting all of the data that we can, right? Mm -hmm. um, obviously, data is can be, can be very expensive too. So it just depends on, you know, what, what your checkbook looks like, um, you know, but for us, it's just however much data that we can get, um, you know, whether it's VIP, you're looking for depletion reports, whether it's spins and you're looking for, you know, for, for scans, what your VPO is, what your AC, what your ACV is, um, you know, that's, that's, that's how you get better, right? It's how you uh, understand how you're performing. That's how you set goals. That's how you, you know, really view this thing as a, as a, as a game, right? We're all athletes here. We're all, we're all here to, at least the poppy, we're all here to, to win, to better ourselves, you know? So literally all, all the data that you can get, you know, Nielsen's IRI as well. Yeah, I, I would I pretty much echo everything Steven said. And as you, you know, move into different types of retailers and channels, different data mm -hmm. becomes very relevant. And then I would also, um, speak to the importance of the anecdotal too, right? I learned so much from recess, especially in the early days in terms of what are the key use cases here? What are the types of retailers and channels where uh, this makes sense, right? There was really no data to go off of because the category literally did not exist, right? So I was really validating, you know, mm -hmm. a hypothesis that I had and really learned uh, a lot, you know, in, especially in the early days of, of launching the brand in terms of uh, what was the right way to position it? What are the, again, right usage occasions, which I think is really, really key, which drives almost everything um, is like, what are the use cases here? Um, and so you're not going to, you know, find a lot of that just, you know, reading a report, right? You kind of have to talk to your customers, listen to your customers, and especially see how they're sharing the, the product in social media. Yeah, yeah. Have have your eyes open, your ears open. Um, in data is a big part, I think, of that for sure. Uh, but then also looking at actually what's happening in the market and what's so great about food and beverages is that you can actually go to the shelf and see <laughs> what's going on, which is very different um, from other kind of um, businesses that aren't so visual um, or tangible. So I'm curious, um, you know, when each of you kind of had the internal discussion around working with a merchandising team, very similar to uh, what dynamic merchandising offers. And, you know, when might you encourage other companies to consider working with such, such services like this? As we know, they can be very helpful um, in making sure that products are, you know, on shelf, displayed well, you know, there and available for customers to buy. But when did that really become a need for you? Um, or how have you been managing that um, to date? I'll, I'll, I'll jump in here. Um, I mean, it, it, it really just depends on what your priorities are, right? And where you're sort of spending your resources. Um, for us, when we use survey.com, it was, do we have critical resets that are coming up, right? Do we have distributors that are falling short where we need product to be merchandised properly, product to be available? You know, do we need to sort of hang tags, right? I think it's it, the great thing is, is it's they, they act as sort of this this blitz crew, at least the way that, that we've been able to use them, you know, and, and so, um, I, yeah, I think it just sort of goes back to what your priorities are that, you know, obviously being on shelf and being available is, is huge and and mm -hmm. also properly servicing the customer. Right. So that's really where we felt where we have found survey.com to be to be super helpful for us. Definitely want to echo that as well. I think definitely prioritizing the timeline of where you are in your company and also when it's going to be best beneficial for you. Um, you know, for Sway, we've been able to do a lot of things grassroots, but I think bringing in those organizations once you're ready, when it makes sense to scale up at the right time for your company in particular, I think it's really important to figure that, to um, identify that at the specific time. Great. 
Um, well, would love to ask, you know, a question that I think has been um, uh, hints of it have been mentioned over the course of our conversation today. But, you know, thinking back on all the things you've done right uh, related to bringing your product to market and scaling, curious, you know, what were some of those, you know, I'll call them um, uh, fortunate mistakes uh, that were made that prompted some of, you know, the, the biggest learnings that you've had um, as CPG uh, and beverage entrepreneurs Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> where, where, where do we start? Yeah. You know, um, you know, I think I think that uh, you know some some entrepreneurs in 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 mind, right? I think that uh, some of the, the like the biggest mistake that um, that people people make is just you know not necessarily jumping in with both feet, right? Uh, kind of being one foot in, one foot out. Um, or even just not not even being both feet in, right? I think it's easy, like um, especially Gen Z, you're in, in millennials, you're, you're almost everyone's an entrepreneur in mindset, right? So I think that that's probably like the first mistake, right? Getting up off the couch is like the, the hardest part of going to the gym, right? It's the hardest part about you know getting into business. So I would just encourage anyone that's got an idea, right? It's just that's the first biggest mistake is just to not take that step, um, you know. But once once you're once you're in it. And once you're committed, right, it's just all about how you how you handle them. Um, you know, it's just sort of these old like cliche adages where it's like it doesn't matter how many times you fall down as long as you get back up and sort of keep moving. And I think that just if you have that understanding as an entrepreneur and sort of just like roll with the punches, um, you know, but I think like my biggest mistake um, is is probably in some of like the, the biggest learnings is sort of identifying like is, is talent management, right? Who are the right people to have on the bus, right? And, and I think that that's sort of the biggest, the, the biggest learning that I've had um, is really sort of not just having great and qualified people, but, but the right people in the right positions. Mm -hmm. Which you often don't know until they're there. <laughs> so understood. Uh, Alana, Ben, any other comments? Or just speak to the importance of like timing, right? Whether it's the timing of like entering uh, a category or, you know, going to create a category, right? I think the timing for recess was very apt. Like our tagline was like an antidote to modern times. And that was about a year before COVID came and, you know, see how, so that was right. And then, you know, that, but there was some mistiming with, uh, as a result of like the implications of the CBD regulations, which definitely constrained uh, our, our growth, right? And so um, I think getting like the timing of various investments, whether it's launching and then, you know, various, uh, you know, forms of scaling uh, is really, really important. Um, and being really thoughtful about that um, and validating or invalidating some of your previous assumptions is probably some of the best kind of advice uh, I, I can give. Because if you're too slow or too fast, that can both kind of hurt you. Um, and I've seen it on kind of both sides. Um, and as again, Reese has a very, very unique situation, but I think in general, timing is almost everything in business. I agree completely. Um, for Slay, because we've been working on it for so long, after having the final product ready, I just wanted to get it out into market right away. And I think that it's really important, you know, not just for CPG founders, but for really everyone who wants to start a company or launch it to really uh, to really identify when you're going to launch it and why. Um, the excitement can really take over in, in large amounts. And I think really having a plan as to why you're going to launch it at that point. And then also, there's so many times when you have big visions for how you want to to scale your company. I think really knowing when it's the right time to implement those and to not put everything and in, to launch it at that moment. Um, but again, timing and to recognize that it's a process, it's a journey and maybe just like timing it out later in different years and not just wanting to load everything up now. Yeah, yeah. great, great advice. Um, and thank you for reflecting on some of those challenges that have presented themselves over the years because we can only expect them. I mean, there's nothing, nothing goes perfectly. And, uh, and so embracing um, the challenges is oftentimes the hardest part, but 
Um, well, I want to I want to switch to some questions that we've had um, submitted through the Q and A and through the chat. So, going back to um, kind of talking about the product and uh, uh, kind of understanding the science aspect of the the beverages that you're selling, um, can you talk a little bit about the bioavailability of your functional claims? Um, how you've proven them? How you've worked with food scientists and formulators to really develop these products and um, uh, the you know kind of validating the impact that you're claiming that they have. Um, who would like to jump in first? Yeah. For, for us, it's, um, you know, for us is, is sort of like food and beverage sort of being modern medicine, if you will. I think that there's, uh, there's, there's sort of a, a lifestyle uh, or, or a life cycle to that rather. And, um, you know, we, we use uh, an ingredient that's been around literally for centuries, right? There's a ton of anecdotal support about good for digestion, um, good for certain things. I think for us, the most important thing, which is sort of like, like Ben always talks about communicating a, um, like the, the use occasion or really communicating a, a feeling behind it, right? And, um, you know, so for us, obviously, as, as we continue to invest in that, not only did we have a personal story that sort of um, validates sort of our functional claim, obviously you need to be careful about what you're claiming and how you write it and things like that, but it's, it's, hard, to, um, uh, it's, it's hard to discount all of this anecdotal evidence that we have. And so we, we use that plus personal story and then, and then obviously some, some additional research that we can do. Um, like as the business grows, right? We're, we're running a, a, a gut health study right now and all of the impacts that it has. So, you know, credibility is definitely something important, but, you know, it's, it's just all about, once again, having that transparency, believing in your product and doing the right things to sort of communicate the efficacy and the credibility over the life cycle of your, of your brand development. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would, I would echo all that. I mean, uh, in our case, there's Kind of a growing body of studies for various functional ingredients uh, around stress relief, calm, relaxation, mood enhancement. Um, you know that that we are referencing, and that's informing kind of the quantities of each functional ingredient that we're including. We take an approach where uh, we kind of infuse multiple kind of functional ingredients together, so CBD or magnesium, together with various forms of adaptogens uh, that kind of work together to kind of deliver this feeling. Um, but within food and beverage, you're definitely uh, threading the needle. You can't make structure function claims uh, mm -hmm. on food and beverages. Um, and so there's, you know, uh, there, there is an art to it for sure. Um, and, um, and yeah, you, yeah, I think it's, yeah, there's, you would definitely want to, you know, uh, cite the, the, the studies that exist. And then as you get more resources, kind of create studies yourself, which is definitely something, you know, we aspire to do. Um, and then also kind of, uh, again, strike the right balance in terms of what claims to put on the label and then how to kind of build the broader brand world uh, around the, the beverage to kind of market the emotion and the feeling. And, and yeah. I'd add one, I was, sorry, I'd add one more, just like the importance of user testimonials. I mean, we get literally, you know, hundreds every week of people validating, you know, what we say is in there. And so I, I think that is very, very important. And those testimonials can be used in a multitude of ways. Yeah, um, I would say it's definitely first clearly showing consumers the gap and how your product is solving the gap um, particularly. So with, so with Sway, we found a study that done by Harvard, their T. Chan Public Health School, that sports drinks aren't truly benefiting children or, or the youth. They're benefiting adults somewhat, but there's no true advantage of drinking them for the youth. So showing them why the sugar overload, how sugar right now, specifically sugar sweetened beverages are leading to one of the one of the huge is um huge public health concerns right now and then showing how we're addressing that with slaves so for example we're working with pediatricians different professional athletes who have been in this space of athletics for a while who have tried the the, the typical sports drinks and now when learning about sway reading about our ingredients the difference in that so also building a, a community of people more, more specifically your target market but also the people who are behind the scenes the nutritionists the, um the and the doctors as well who can really attest to it as well i think it's really really important Absolutely. And I would add a plug for uh, the Tufts Friedman School of Nutrition. Uh, we're, we're Boston based. Tufts is in our neighborhood and um, they are, you know, a leader in trusted food science um, and research that 
I think in many cases can be um, cited for new products coming to market that have specific health claims um, and marketing claims that they're using to, you know, support product sales and help consumers understand, you know, what the function of some of these ingredients are and what effect they will have on their bodies. So um, definitely check out some of their work um, as you're all uh, kind of interested in this space, potentially launching um, brands that have in intended functional benefits. Um, moving on, another question that we received was, how does culture and authenticity play into your brand and marketing? I thought, I think we talked a little bit about the authenticity, but maybe the culture aspect of it, you can touch on uh, related to perhaps your, your team and then as well as others um, that may be uh, uh, customers of yours and that culture that you're trying to create. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I can start with that. I mean, I when I came up with the idea for recess, I'd never I honestly thought about creating a food or beverage, didn't really spend time thinking about the category. And you know, my observation, if you think about like what the the leading functional beverage brands uh, did is they really broke through by integrating and creating culture uh, in some way. If you look at Gatorade and you know, you know, disregard the quality, but it's like undeniable like how they've integrated into kind of sports culture or same with Red Bull and Monster or every alcohol brand. I think it's just true that the most successful beverage brands are bigger than the beverage uh, in some way. Mm -hmm. um, and for us, uh, Recess, we really focused on kind of integrating to kind of creative culture um, to, to, to begin. Um, and I think it was one of the, you know, we were really put on the map in addition to kind of introducing this new functional proposition, it was like doing really, really innovative brand marketing stuff, you know, in the early days, which at the time people weren't really doing, whether it was, you know, to begin like our interesting brand world that we created in Instagram, or one of the most impactful things we did was create this pop-up in New York called Recess IRL, which really, which was like a, a retail space in kind of Soho in Manhattan that really felt like you were walking kind of into our Instagram and we would host, you know, four events a week there for six months with like the coolest brands and people, you know, in New York at that space that had nothing to do with CBD or, you know, really the proposition was really about uh, creating kind of a space um, that allowed people to connect offline in real life um, and kind of celebrate like the vibe of recess, mm -hmm. right? And I think, uh, you know, uh, Poppy has done an amazing job at, at this as well. It's not just you know, marketing apple cider vinegar in a, in a tasty beverage, but it's a whole, it's, it's a vibe, it's a feel, right? Um, and I think it's a prerequisite for breaking through uh, in this day and age. Yeah, well, I'll be curious to see how that translates into the metaverse in the coming years. Um, but <laughs> for now, we're still in the real world. And, yep. uh, and those, you know, um, uh, opportunities for experiences speak volumes um, about, uh, about the brand as well as I think get you know, such natural engagement and um, uh, uh, kind of that viral marketing aspect that is, um, you know, really hard to inspire otherwise. Absolutely. Great. I mean, I, I think that's just like an important point, which is that touching on my point earlier around the importance of earned media, especially when you're, mm. you just don't have enough money in the early days to spend money on like paid media to generate enough awareness. And so you really need to create moments um, that are going to go viral, you know, themselves and generate press, generate sharing uh, within Instagram and TikTok and, and the like. Um, and I think, again, that's super, super critical and something to kind of design your entire business plan around uh, to a degree, because it's just such a competitive environment today. And I, I just, you know, think about Poppy, you guys have, you know, have had a lot of brands entering the space, but to me, most of them, there's only, you know, maybe one that gets as much remotely like earned median buzz as you guys. And there's others, plenty of other people just selling, you know, prebiotic soda, but you never hear about them. And at a certain point, you know, their, I think growth will, you know, run out. And um, so. Great. Well, I um, have one other question, which is a little bit differentiated from the line of questions that I've had so far, but um, with regards to showcasing your brand at events, uh, can you talk a little bit about the benefit of doing that? Um, the event reference in the question was mass market retailers, but you know, I'll, I'll also ask just about Expo East, Expo West, 
the um, specialty foods association, fancy food show, um, you know, how do you think about those types of more industry related events, those trade shows um, and the importance of them as you've scaled your, your own brands? I mean, I can go first. I mean, it really, it's, you know, this is gonna be our really first Expo West that we're uh, presenting at because COVID for the past two years and we launched a year before COVID. So it wasn't, has not been uh, a critical factor uh, in our growth and um, it will be moving forward. And I imagine the same is true for Steve. Yeah, yeah. I think, uh, Ben, Expo 2020 was gonna be your first one. Uh, we were supposed to be, yeah, it was going to be our first one. And I remember like unraveling in real time. Yeah. So we, so we were, uh, for us, it was Expo West 2020. Like we were one of the few that, you know, uh, we're from Texas. Don't judge us when COVID happens, you know, Texas, whatever, uh, kind of a funny joke, but we, we, we set up anyways. We're like, we had so much invested into it. Um, you know, and so we were like one of the few that set up and, and ultimately, you know, packed it up and put it away. So like Ben, we haven't really had the benefit of, of Expo. I think, um, so it'll be interesting to see what sort of factor plays, but, you know, as, as Ben sort of talks about like these, these IRL experiences, right. It's just like, you talk about the metaverse and things like this, but, you know, for me, I'm a big believer. We're all humans. We like to be connected. Uh, and that connectivity is, is best done in person. Right. And so I think just the relationships that you can build, uh, in person, is just, it's, it's, you can't really replicate it from my opinion in, in, in from my viewpoint. Right. And so. It'll be just really great to, you know, meet a bunch of new people, solidify and expand the relationships that we have. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm really looking forward to it for sure, but haven't really had the benefit of, of any sort of trade activity since we launched. Yeah. In addition to, I mean, that like more trade focused events, mm -hmm. you know, a big part of recess, especially in the early days was like in New York, if you were throwing an event, like whether it's a boutique, you know, you know, meet up, you name it, people would reach out to us and we would just, you know, we'd had, so it was like someone's full-time job basically just to deliver products for their, to, to those, uh, you know, events. And so I think you want to be where people are, right. Uh, especially, uh, in, in the early days. Um, and I'd say that's now that COVID's on the decline, um, that's going to be a big, you know, part of, uh, what we focus on and, you know, all the markets that we're in. Absolutely. Same with Slay. We launched in 2021. So, you, you know, like really during COVID, but we were able to really have different types of events with our, with different athletes and get into their communities as well, which has helped with our consumers. I think if you if you can't go to one of the fancy food shows or one of the food trade shows in general, I would really try to connect with your consumers a different way, going back to recesses events and then also um, different maybe brand ambassadors like you have with Poppy and working with them to create your own original events, I think would be helpful. Yeah, reminder, reminding people of that importance of authenticity uh, with related to related to where you're showing up as a brand in terms of these events and these um, uh, things that you're doing on the marketing side, but then, you know, also the ability to connect with um, members of the industry at some of the trade shows, I think is incredibly important. And we're all looking forward, I think, to getting back um, in person at those very soon. Um, well, I know we're coming to the top of the hour. We have one minute left. Any future predictions for the functional beverage um, space, the different categories that functional beverages are playing in, trends that might be bubbling up, no pun intended. Uh, very curious to know what's on the horizon for, for each of you as you look so closely um, at this space. Yeah, I mean, it's, it sounds like you've got some thoughts brewing there. If Ben, if you want to take the lead on that, if not, I can jump in. Go, go first, please. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think like, you know, Functional beverage, it's just, it, I think that, like there's some really key pillars around and I think Ben has had a, a really innovative sort of additional pillar, right? I think gut health has been a pillar. Uh, I think like brain function uh, is, is, is a pillar like nootropics and things like that. Uh, and then, you know, energy is always just like top of, top of mind, right? I think you guys are the antidote to that, which I think is, is really smart and has served you really well. Um, you know, so I think for us, uh, it's really sort of, I, I think that those are sort of the, the macro trends, if you will, to be like sort of innovation within those pillars and things like that. Um, but once again, it sort of goes back to, you know, for us, it's just a, like a, we, we built our, our platform, like this sort of, you know, Gen Z is really in our DNA, right? Being creative, always uh, innovating, always adapting and things like that. So 
you know, I can't say one specific trend, but I would, I would have to say that there's just going to be sort of over the next three to four years, there's going to be more innovation within these sort of key pillars. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, one of the things I think about is like, we're going from this like better for you era, which in some ways meant like less bad, like mm -hmm. low sugar to, to food as medicine, which is better for you. Plus like added benefit and functionality, which I think is like expected. Um, and so I think, you know, nearly every category, you know, including even candy, right? Like one of my favorite, like I, I love this brand, like midday squares, which is like this chocolate bar with like added protein and things like that. Like, that's a great example is like, uh, you know, something that's indulgent, but plus like adds a functional benefit. And I think that's going to be uh, a massive trend. And then I think the other one is just like how that benefit is articulated. And I think we're, we're, you know, over the past three or four years, like, I think that's, you know, it's much more of a, I think brand marketing driven approach versus in the past, it was a little bit more like, you know, you know, when the kombucha category was first started, like they weren't innovating on the brand marketing of that. That was really just like a natural product. Right. And I don't think that's going to, you're not going to be able to break through on any national scale, taking that approach anymore. You really do need to build, I think, kind of a lifestyle brand and take a unique angle uh, today. And I think, I think the other one is just like having a unique angle. I mean, when I, so when I launched, like my friends thought I was crazy for launching a beverage company. And now everyone is like launching a food or beverage company. Right. And it's just like, it's such a competitive space. Now there's so many brands going to be, if it's a good idea, then there's going to be many, many brands going after it. And in order to break through, you have to have a differentiated angle. Right. And if it's, if there's not competition, then it's not a good idea almost by definition. Right. So like, what is your angle going to be to break through? I think is something to really, really think about and be, you know, really differentiated against. Yeah, you know, um, consumers will really drive this, I think, in the future, of course. I think that they're really going to be looking for brands that identify them in particular. Maybe it's an age group, maybe it's a demographic and how brands are, are specifically making products for them. Also, going back to brand transparency, I think that consumers are going to be wanting to know more and more about products and why they've included those ingredients in the products, because now we call it the smart consumer at Slay. People are growing up in an age where you have mobile devices at, at your fingertips. You can find it a abundance of information in a matter of seconds. So there's really no hiding behind um, nutrition fact tables or anything right now. Everything's out and you can learn about ingredients if they're good for you, if they're bad for you, if you should include them, if you should not include them. So I think that's going to be a really big trend and it's ensuring that companies stay on top of that and ensure that every single, every single ingredient in their product is going to be beneficial to their target consumer. Wonderful. Well, thank you all so much for your time. I want to welcome Carol back to the stage here to wrap us up. Um, really appreciated this and enjoyed hearing from each of you on what's been so um, successful about your uh, path to market, uh, particularly in retail, but also related to the products that you're selling. So thank you. Thank you, Lauren and Ben and Stephen and Alana for sharing your insights with our community today. And uh, very well said, the la those last few comments were uh, very representative of where the industry is heading. And thanks again for sharing some of your, the lessons that you've learned while taking your functional beverage to the market and growing your brand. And thank you all for attending. Uh, we'll be back next Thursday, March 3rd at 12 p.m. Eastern time, time at our March community table. Registration is free and we hope to see you all then. Uh, and be sure to mark your calendars for our Food Edge annual summit that will take place on May 3rd, 4th, and 5th, 2022. We'll be announcing the agenda and releasing the early bird tickets very soon, so st stay tuned. If you have any questions or would like to engage with us, please reach out at info at branchfood.com. We would love to connect. Stay safe, everyone. Have a good one. And thanks again to our amazing panelists. And thank you, Lauren, for moderating this very insightful discussion. Thanks, thanks everyone. Take care. Thanks, guys. Thank you.